It is good to be back with you all. And I want to just thank Kimberly. I have already thanked her personally, but I just want to thank her amongst the community for preaching last week so that we could get away and visit with some family in Virginia. We had a great time. We came back renewed, and it's been a whirlwind of a week since we have been back. And so um, it was good that we had some renewal time because fall is rapidly approaching, and there's a lot I know on everyone's plates. Um, But for the next eight weeks, we're going to continue to separate from the busyness of the world and gather on Wednesday evenings to explore the Psalms. And we created a new message series called Sing a New Song. And that comes directly from Psalm 40, which Aaron is going to probably preach on in just a couple weeks. Um, But that's not the only reason that we chose that song. Throughout the Psalms, the imperative sing to the Lord appears 29 times. And specifically, we're given the instructions to sing a new song nine times. So it's a major theme throughout this book of Psalms. It directs God's people to lift not only their voice, but their entire lives placing it before God as their song of worship. And if you are one of those who don't use an old-fashioned real Bible all that often and you happen to want to pick one up to read the Psalms, all you have to do is just let it open to the middle and you will find the Psalms. I hardly ever use one anymore, but in case you wanted to, that is where you will find it. And essentially what this book is, is it's a collection of Hebraic poetry that was and often still is set to music. The breadth of the material really captures the depth of our human experience, including praise and worship. It includes lament and adoration. It includes questions and answers and observations. And it does all of this in a way that invites us in to the experience so that we can be inspired and grow in our spiritual journey. Now, King David is the one who's actually usually attributed with having written these 150 psalms that are a part of this book, but he wasn't the only contributor. Based on the content and based on other things that we see in history and scripture, we know that he was indeed the major contributor, but David didn't write them all. The one we're looking at tonight, we know that he wrote, but he didn't write them all. Regardless of who wrote them, though, these 150 psalms that have been canonized continue to be a vital part of worship, and they've proven to be an untold source of encouragement and comfort and wisdom and guidance for God's people, not only for us today, but for thousands of years. God's people have turned to these songs for encouragement and guidance. And so we are going to continue to do that over the next eight weeks. We're not going to explore all 150. We're going to select one each week to focus on. Um, But it is interesting to note, before we get to our psalm for today, just to kind of look at the book as a whole, the very first psalm that appears is actually not a song at all. It's a beatitude in which David is declaring, blessed are those who delight in the law of the Lord. In other words, happy are those who follow God's way of living. And scholars believe that this psalm was particularly chosen to be the first that appears in this songbook, not only because it has its own sacred wisdom to offer us, but it provides a lens through which we're meant to read all of the psalms so that at all times, in all things, God always is to be sought after for the way to life. And so then Psalm 2 through 7 launch into proving that to be the case. They are all songs of salvation, crying out to God for God's protection and God's provision, God's guidance and God's healing. And then we arrive at our psalm for this evening, which is Psalm number 8, which is the very first song of praise that we find in the Psalms. And so here now, the word of God, if you'd like to read along, it is on the back of your bulletin. For the music leader, according to the Gittith, a Psalm of David. And I'm gonna pause there for just a moment. We won't normally pause, but in case you don't know what a Gittith is, I didn't know, it's an instrument. And this is a old, 
um, icon that we have within our church history that has David playing one of these. It's kind of like a guitar. Um, I looked up some old images of it. I'll put it here. Um, some old images of it, and it looks very, most of the relics look very much like what we see in this particular picture. So as you come for communion, you can take a look at it or come afterwards. But essentially, it's this guitar-like string instrument, which I can relate to because I play guitar. So this is a song written to be sung with a gittith. And here's what David says. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. You made your glory higher than the heaven. From the mouths of nursing babes, you have laid a strong foundation because of your foes in order to stop vengeful enemies. I think I skipped a verse. Let me back up. From the mouths of nursing babes, you have laid a strong foundation because of your foes in order to stop vengeful enemies. When I look up at your skies, at what your fingers made, the moon and the stars that you set, firmly in place. What are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? You've made them only slightly less than divine, crowning them with glory and grandeur. You've let them rule over your handiwork, putting everything under their feet, all sheep and all cattle, the wild animals too, the birds in the sky, the fish of the ocean, everything that travels the pathways of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. The word of God for us, the people of God, and God's people say, thanks be to God. Let's pray. God of wonders, we stand in awe of your majesty. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here so that as the scripture has been read and your word is now proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. What an amazing declaration Psalm 8 makes. As one scholar puts it, King David, whom God had anointed to have dominion over all of Israel, declares the Lord, Yahweh, is the true cosmic ruler and king because the Lord alone has mastered chaos and founded all that exists. Put another way, this psalm rightly recognizes the enormity of God and proclaims that creation displays God's majesty as a means of establishing our right perspective on who God is, so that the reader and the worshiper can rightly understand who they are. As science has progressed throughout the years, it has only served to prove King David right. With the development of the Hubble telescope, we have now been able to look out further into space than we ever have before. And we have learned that our galaxy, which is called the Milky Way, is only one in a billion galaxies that make up the expanse of our universe. Our universe is so big that we can't even use earthly measurements to begin to have any relevant conversation about the size of it. Instead, scientists measure the distance in space by light years, which is the speed at which light can travel in one direction in an entire year, which is almost six trillion miles. That's one light year. And it turns out that the largest and one of the last four stars in our galaxy alone is called the V.Y. Canis Majoris. It's also known as the Big Dog Star. That's its name. The Canis means canine, and major is, is big. It's big, so a Big Dog Star. This Big Dog Star is almost 4,900 light years from Earth. Just let that soak in for a second light years. Numbers like that make my head begin to swim, and that's just within our own galaxy, and we're one of one billion. And the size of what is in 
our galaxy is also astounding. What I'm sharing with you actually blew my mind when I first heard it. I heard all of this actually at a Chris Tomlin concert when Louis Giglio was preaching, and he helped us try to gain some understanding of what this really means. So he talked about the Earth and the Earth's diameter all the way across the middle of it. The Earth is just over 7,900 miles in its diameter. Okay, now hold that in your mind. It's a big number. In comparison, our sun is 865,000 miles in diameter. The Canis Majoris, that big dog star that we talked about, at the edge of our galaxy, it's 1.7 billion miles in diameter. What does that even mean in terms of, I can't even fathom that. I try, but I can't. And so here's one simple way to help us try to understand this. It's the image of a golf ball. If this were the earth, this is us, and we're this tiny, there's a little spot on it. You see it? If you don't see, you can come see it later. There's a little piece of dust or fragment of dirt. Pretend that's us kind of at the far corner of that dust. Here tonight, worshiping. That's us, okay? So if we were the earth, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter, and one million golf balls would fill up the sun. That's an entire busload of these. Now let's take that a step further. You go out that 4,900 light years out to Canis Majoris, and it's seven quadrillion golf balls to fill up Canis Majoris. It's the equivalent of enough golf balls to fill up the entire state of Texas two feet deep. That's a lot of golf balls. Are you feeling small yet? That's kind of part of David's point in this psalm. The enormity of God is beyond comparison and it is beyond our comprehension, which is why creation, we need all of creation in all of its expansive glory to even begin to help bring about praise and glory that yields that is due to the majesty of God. God is enormous. Canis Majoris is just one star within our galaxy that's part of a billion galaxies. And God created all of this and is bigger than all of it. And yet, God cares for us. Us, human beings. In fact, Scripture says that God treasures us beyond all all other creation, because we were created to bear God's image in the world, to be co-creators with God in his creative work. Embracing our smallness is not intended to be a curse at all. In fact, it is intended to be a blessing for us. It's a gift because it provides us a new lens, and it gives us freedom to rightly remember how big God really is and how small we are so that we can detach ourselves from the things that this world insists are what make us important and make us big. Because in the expanse of the entire universe, those things are minuscule. We begin to have a right view of God and a right view of ourselves so that we start to see ourselves the way God intended for us to be seen. And more importantly, scripture and science prove that our relative size to others and to our universe does not determine our ability to have tremendous impact in our world. We see this story played out with David and Goliath. Against all odds, this young boy who was not yet king but still a shepherd in the field decided to pick up a rock and take on a giant because that giant was threatening the safety of all of Israel. And he took him out because of God's help. 
If we fast forward to look at how people who we would otherwise overlook can impact us, what about the story of Malala, a young girl who stood up to the Taliban because they insisted that girls could not be educated, but she still decided to go to school. And she and her friends, when she was sitting in class one day, were shot at by the Taliban. And thankfully, she survived this attempted ex execution of her. And at the age of 11, when she had healed enough, she wrote a book. And that book has gone around the world and inspired thousands of people to work towards justice, brought about awareness, and they're working towards putting an end towards terrorism. One girl can make a difference. God's created order does not value size the way human beings tend to equate size with power. Small people, small things really can have tremendous impact. Science again demonstrates what scripture proclaims and it does it beautifully when we turn our technology away from the macro and we turn it towards the study of all that exists at a micro level. There we discover the atom. We can't see it with the naked eye, and yet we know that it's the foundational building block upon which everything else exists. And when the atom is split apart, nuclear energy is released, and it has incredible power that can either be harnessed for good or it can be unleashed for evil. And as I ponder all of this, in light of the time we just had with our family, I was reminded of the time we spent in our van. We have one of those DVD players that allows us to keep the kids entertained as we go, and I call that a creation that is God's mercy exponentially expounded. <laughs> but in God's mercy, our kids chose to watch the movie Horton Hears a Who. Anybody familiar with Dr. Seuss's familiar tale, Horton Hears a Who? Okay, well, if you haven't heard the story of Horton, he's an elephant, and he hears a cry from a clover that is floating through the air. And then upon further investigation, he discovers that there's an entire world that exists on this small clover. The Who's, which is what they are known to be, are in great danger because their world is about to be annihilated if they don't find some stability. So Horton makes a promise to the mayor, and he promises to help them find a safe and stable place where they can thrive. And ultimately, as the story unfolds, Horton ends up risking his reputation and even facing demise to protect them because he meant what he said when he said what he meant because of elephants faithful 100%. And of course, Horton does eventually help them succeed the entire jungle could not hear them, so they did not believe they existed. And Horton had to rally all the Who's down in Whoville to sing in one accord, to sing a song out loud, we are here, we are here, we are here, we are here. And in doing so, he helps them be heard and seen, and because of that is able to help them find a safe place to eventually thrive in peace. And we love tales like this. They become classics because they ring with truth and they point us to our own humanity in light of the expanse of God's universe and all those big numbers I just gave you. The reality is, is we are a speck. We really are. But Psalm 8 then reminds us God made us only slightly less than divine crowning humankind with glory and grandeur, creating us to rule over all of God's handiwork. As we ponder all of this, it puts a whole new perspective on what it means to be God-breathed dust, doesn't it? But thankfully, God didn't just create creation with some big stuff and some small stuff and then walk away, wipe off his hands, and watch it all unfold from a distance. Scripture proclaims that God is continually at work creating and recreating everything that he set in motion. What's more, Scripture declares that somehow, like that atom when it split, somehow, because God created us in his image, 
we, like that Adam, have untold capability and potential to impact not only our world, but this universe. And we see this most vividly displayed on the cross. In order to set right the brokenness that human sin had unleashed upon the earth and upon the universe, God came in the form of a human being. And through Christ's death and resurrection, God paved a way to save us and make us new, once again restoring God's image within us so that we could continue to be co-creators with God. And so as big as Canis Majoris really is, or the expanse of the universe, it was through sacrificial love embodied in a human being that unleashed exponential atomic force redemption that is still reverberating throughout our galaxy and beyond. That's a lot to ponder. That's a lot to take in. I think our minds just start to shut down a little bit when we meditate on that truth. It's beyond what we can truly grasp. And yet, it is precisely because of that that we are employed to praise God with a cosmic size response because God's majesty and glory and the grace that make it all true are worthy of nothing less. And it may just be me, but as I was pondering all of this, I just got to feel the weight of it in my gut, which led me to reflect on the fact that if all of this is true, if it's really true, if we have that much potential, then we may be small, but we are mighty. That is who we are created to be, a mighty force to be reckoned, reckoned with. We are not to cower from evil. We are not to cower from darkness. We are to stand up and be who we were created to be. We are to bear witness to the majesty of God's glory and God's grace. And we are to carry God's work on in the world, reflecting and mirroring his image in such a way that redemption continues to be unleashed and continues to reverberate throughout our universe. And so how do we do that? Well, we would think it'd be something big and grand, but according to scripture, it's the way we live our lives. It's the moment by moment, big stuff and little stuff, the way we allow God to guide us makes all the difference in terms of what we are unleashing in our world. It also means that we can use this power for good or for evil, and so we have to make a choice. We see this played out time and time again in history in our own lives and in our ancient world. It doesn't matter. All I have to do is look back a little bit. And you can see seeds that were planted for goodness bear good fruit. And seeds that were intended for harm often bring just that. God has a way of reconciling that and redeeming it. But we participate in what is unfolding moment by moment. And so what we do and how we spend our money and how we spend our time and where we place our focus, how we care for creation, it all really matters. We have power, and yet so many of us feel like we don't. I often do when I think about things like devastating diseases like cancer or other issues that people face with health or eliminating poverty and starvation, terrorism and human trafficking. I easily come to the end of myself when I think about the, the hurt that people experience in the brokenness of relationships, loss of income and so on. As a pastor, I get to hear all of that and it can be, it can be overwhelming at times and start to make you feel like, if you're so big, why do we feel so powerless? And if we're created in your image and we're supposed to have this exponential power, why isn't it working? But Psalm 8 points us to the answer. It points us to the fact that sometimes we forget how big God really is and we overinflate how big we are or our problems are. And when that happens and we skew our view of what is truth, 
We put up roadblocks for God to work in our lives and to work through our lives. We start deciding how God should fix things, and then we get involved doing it without really asking God if that was the right way. What's more is that there's this issue of free will. So yes, God is all-powerful, and yes, we were created to embody that power, but God gave us free will. And what makes that so unique and distinctive is it is what separates us from all other creation. And it's precisely because of free will that we have the power that we do. If God were to override free will and wipe out all of its consequences, not only would the power of the cross lose its ability to save us, but all of creation as we understand it and know it today would literally become, come apart at the seams. Now, that doesn't leave us without hope. We're never without hope because there's more to our existence than this side of eternity. And more than that, when we feel like the world is crashing in on us, Psalm 8 is a powerful reminder that God is big enough to handle whatever comes our way. As we allow that to soak in, God is asking us to let him help us form our choices and our decisions around God's way to eternal life and abundant living. And so Psalm 8, while it declares God's glory and majesty and reminds us that we are made in that image, it also challenges us to really examine our lives and ask, how are we singing a song of cosmic praise to God? How are we taking our small, everyday, ordinary life, our eating, sleeping, going to work, walking around life that has the potential of atomic force redemption to save this world? How are we taking that and placing it before God as our offering and allowing God to shape it and mold it so that it becomes a force for good in this world? We get to choose each and every day, what kind of song we are going to sing with the lives that we live. And you have more power to influence good in this world than you can even imagine. And so may we, who declare that we follow the risen Lord, may we choose to put our trust in God and do so in ways that declare God's glory and God's majesty with cosmic praise, shouting in our own way, we are here, we are here, we are here. We will not go down easily. We will be heard. We will make a difference. We are going to be agents of transformation and change that point to God alone for his majesty and his glory and his grace and his love that has come to save us all. May we do so when we make those choices again and again and again, knowing that God's mercies join us every morning for renewed strength for the journey ahead. So go, my friends, and sing your song of cosmic praise and do it boldly and do it loudly. Amen. <laughs>